Good morning, OBC. It's great to have you online with us. Immediately after uh, this uh, morning broadcast of our service, we will have a fellowship over Zoom just like we did last week. And so uh, check your email for that uh, link, for that uh, information. And I hope you'll join us right after this service for, the, uh, for just a time of fellowship over Zoom. Back in, uh, I forget, sometime in the 1970s, uh, 77, 78, my parents transferred me from Sycamore Park Public Schools to Bethlehem Baptist Christian Academy. And from third grade to 12th grade, I attended Bethlehem Baptist Christian Academy, a.k.a. BBCA. I have many fond memories of my time at BBCA, and I appreciate the hard work that the faculty and administration put into making that a quality educational experience for not only myself, but for my peers as well. And uh, I've shared with you before in my testimony, I actually went back years later and taught at that very same school that I graduated from. And so uh, I, I appreciate Bethlehem Baptist Christian Academy, which later became Fair Oaks Academy. And so I appreciate uh, everyone that worked so hard to make uh, BBCA and later FOA uh, a wonderful Christian school. And I'm grateful that, uh, that my parents made the sacrifice and my grandfather also helped with my tuition uh, to, to be a part of that. But when I was growing up uh, in that Christian school and also in the very strict Baptist environment I grew up in, um, I, uh, I got this impression of God as someone that just wanted to make sure that we do the right stuff, you know, that we do the right thing, you know. And so my upbringing was a lot of do this but don't do that kind of thing. And, and so it, after a while you get the impression that God is all about our beliefs and our conduct and that's pretty much it. Um, but there's more to God than that, much more to God than that, and there's much more to the Christian life than that. Beliefs and conduct are very important. Just read the book of James and you'll see that. But God wants a relationship with us. We are part of his family. If you've given your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, you're part of the family of God. And families thrive on relationships. And in order for us to have a quality relationship with God, we've got to have quality communication with God. This is why A.W. Tozer writes, It is not mere words that nourish the soul, but God himself. And it's why Henry Blackaby writes, If you have trouble hearing God speak, you are in trouble at the very heart of your Christian experience. It is crucial that we hear from God and that we experience God. I am pouring my heart into this series. It is that important. And I am consulting with a lot of resources, a lot of books, a lot of authors, a lot of uh, uh, Christian theologians and pastors in, in preparing for this series. I'm putting my heart into this, and I would ask that you commit to this series yourself. Now, of course, of all the books that I'm consulting for this series, the one I'm consulting the most, of course, is the Bible itself because the Word of God has a lot to say about how we communicate with God and how we can hear from God. And so I'm asking you to commit to this series, um, and you can commit to this series in three ways. Number one, pray for it. Please pray that this series will be a blessing to others. Please pray that this series will touch the hearts and the souls of people in a way that they will improve their relationship with God and draw closer to Him like never before. Please pray for yourself also in that respect, that God will teach you what you need to learn from this series. The second thing I want to ask is that you uh, commit to this series by, by being here each Sunday. Uh, be online while your church is online, and then be in, in person or online. Back in Feb Hopefully in February we're going to resume uh, both uh, you know, the hybrid so you can watch online or be in person. Make sure you're one or the other, okay? Make sure you're participating in this series. We're going to run this series starting today through the end of February. And so participate in the series. Be a part of it, okay? And the third, and, and as part of it, also be reading the scriptures yourself. When I preach on a particular prayer or a particular passage, then study that throughout the week yourself. All right, and then, and then finally, I'd encourage you to get a prayer journal. There's nothing magical or formulaic about a prayer journal, but it worked for the writers of the book of Psalms. Uh, the Psalms are basically written out prayers or written out praises to God. And so, uh, so if it works for, if it's good enough for the writers of the book of Psalms, it's good enough for you and me. And so I'd encourage you to get a prayer journal and track your spiritual progress during this series. Now, as I talk about this series, I want you to understand I'm not putting the emphasis on me. I'm putting the emphasis on the Word of God and on God Himself. 
and and know that it is important that we learn what God wants us to learn from this series. So please pray for this series, commit to this series, and get yourself a prayer journal. It can be simple. It can be um, you can do it on your iPad or on your phone, or or it can be just a, a notebook or even just some pieces of paper. You know, whatever you want to use. You know, but track your prayer requests and your progress in your spiritual life through this series. At the end of each sermon, I'm going to give you some action items that you're going to kind of record and, and work on in that prayer journal. And so, so uh, you know, if you really want to get a lot out of the series, then it's going to be on you to really participate. You'll get out of it what you put into it, okay? But can I just say there's nothing more important in your relationship with God. And as part of that relationship, what can be more important than hearing from God? And so, so please commit to this series. I Trust me, if you will do that... I believe God will change your heart and change your life and do so in, a, in, a, in a, an incredible, abundant way. And so today we begin our series, Experiencing God Through Prayer. Each week in this series, we will profile a prayer in the Bible, and we will learn the lessons that God wants us to learn from that prayer in the Bible. We're going to culminate this series by looking at the Lord's Prayer, otherwise known as the Disciples' Prayer, where Jesus teaches us how to pray. That will be the culmination of our series. But you will find that as we go through this prayer series, looking at select passages of Scripture in the Bible which profile important prayers, you will find uh, that uh, that there's many references to the themes of the Lord's Prayer uh, throughout. Uh, again, the Lord's Prayer itself should not be seen simply as something that we recite, memorize and recite. The Lord's Prayer is a template it basically is telling us the principles of prayer and that our prayer needs to incorporate those principles. Uh, so you'll see those principles throughout this series. For today, we are going to start our series with the issue of what God wants. So the, the title of my message today is What God Wants. It stands to reason that if we want things from God, we might want to ask ourselves, what does God want from us? If we want good things from our prayer life, then what does God want in us? How should we approach God? What does the Bible say about this? And so today we're going to look at, I think, one of the most fundamental and important questions when it comes to the issue of prayer, and that is, what does God want from us? What does he want from his people? And so we're going to look today at one of the most famous answers to prayer found in the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles, you can open up the Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 7. But I will project the verse for you on the screen. In 2 Chronicles, we see King Solomon dedicating the temple to the Lord. And God answers that prayer in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And I'm going to key on one verse in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. It is the most popular verse uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And that's going to be the theme of our message today. God says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Father, once again, I ask your blessing on this message today, and I ask that you give me only the words you'd have me to say about this very important passage. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage is often cited in the context of us asking God for some kind of national revival. Pulpits throughout our country often cite this passage as if God's church in America were to do this, then God would heal America. Before we get too carried away down that line of thinking, though, it's important that we study the Bible in context. We have to understand the Bible for what it is actually saying. And the pastor who presided over my ordination used to put it this way. In order to understand what a Bible passage means, we must first understand what it meant. King Solomon is the king of Israel. The Jewish people are God's chosen people. God has a special covenant relationship with the nation of Israel. We see this throughout the Old Testament. King Solomon is dedicating the temple to God. He's asking God to receive that dedication. He's also asking God to heal Israel, to not forget Israel, and to bless them. 2 Chronicles 7.14 is God's response to that. So what are the principles of 2 Chronicles 7.14 for us? Now, of course, when we tackle a 
question like this or any kind of Bible passage, uh, one of the first things that we today look for is relevancy. You know, what, how is this relevant to me? You know, it's great that King Solomon dedicated the temple, but that's 3,000 years ago. We don't have a temple like that today. The church certainly is not a temple. The Apostle Paul says your body's the temple, but, you know, how does this apply to us today? What are the, what are the lessons for us today? How do we apply this? And so that's what we're going to look at right now. Now, of course, there's that great question, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? And so for you to understand the importance of this, I think it's important that we get the benefits of it. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, you look at the benefits. The benefits are clear. Uh, God will hear from heaven. He will forgive their sin and, and heal their land. First, God's going to hear from heaven. Do you want your prayers heard? Do you want to know that when you pray that God's listening? Or do you want to feel like your prayers don't get higher than the ceiling? So if you want to know that God's hearing you, that God is hearing your prayers, uh, then this is an important message for you to listen to. And this is an important passage for you to reflect on. The second thing we see here is that he will uh, forgive their sin. Uh, do you want to have your fellowship restored with God? Do you want to know that you are going to be not just heard by God, but you're going to be approved unto God, that you're, that God's going to forgive you, you know, for your, for your sins, for your shortcomings. He will forgive you. Um, if you want to experience that forgiveness, then pay attention to this message in this passage, okay? And then 30, we see it heal their land. Now, again, we're not living in the land of Israel, okay? And certainly we're not living in the land of Israel 3,000 years ago. But I do believe there's a principle here. I believe that if God's people are crying out to God from a particular community or from a particular environment, and they're asking God to manifest himself in that environment, in that community, they're asking God for God to, to heal their land, to heal their community, to bless them. This could be your family, it could be your marriage, it could be your church, it could be uh, your experience in your workplace, it could be, um, you know, it could be your country, you know, whatever country it is, whether we're talking about the United States or Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Madagascar or Yemen or, or France or Britain or whatever, um, you know, whatever community uh, God's people are crying out from, I do believe there's an important principle here. I do believe you can see the heart of God in his response. And so, so, um, but I really want to apply this to us at the individual level and the family level, okay? And that is this, if you right now want God's healing in a particular area or aspect of your life, that healing could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be spiritual, it could be all three, then pay attention to this message. Pay attention to this passage. And so looking at it in that light, let's look at that passage again. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. If you want a robust prayer life where you know that you are in communication with God and in sync with God and that you are seeing results from your prayers to God, then you need to meditate on this passage and pay attention to this message, okay? And so what does God want from us? The first thing we see is God identifies his people as indeed his people who are called by my name. So the very first thing that you need to look at is, are you one of God's people? Are you in that group? All right, how do you identify? You know, identity is a big issue in our world today. People identify as white, as black, as, as a woman, as a man, identify as transgender, as as all kinds of different things. We identify as Republicans or Democrats. We identify as, as you know, fans of, of uh, the Washington football team. Well, not a lot of people are proudly identifying that way these days, but you know what I'm saying. We identify as, as fans of this group or that group or fans of this celebrity or that celebrity. We identify as supporters of this movement or that movement or this point of view or that. Um, and so fan, you know, we, we, identification rather is very, is a big deal in our society today, but God wants to know if you identify with him, you know, ultimately your primary number one identity should be in God. You are either a man of God or woman of God or a child of God. If you're still a child, in fact, even if you're an adult, you're a child of God. You know, I mean, the fact is you've got to identify as one of God's people. You are God's person. You are God's, you're, you, you are in God's family. That must be your primary identity. 
you know, and in the New Testament context and in our, in our current post-New Testament context, if you identify with Christ, then you're a Christian, a follower of Christ. That should be the most important thing to you. And so whatever principles or promises or applications you want to derive from this passage or any other passage, the very first question you need to ask yourself is where do you stand in relationship with God? You know, in Romans 10, verse 9, when Paul says, you know, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That word confession is not simply talking about confessing like, I'm sorry for my sins. That's certainly part of it. But the confession in that case is a declaration where you are actually standing with Christ. You're standing with God. And you're saying, I'm with him. I'm with Jesus. I identify with Jesus. And I'm going to ask you very bluntly here, is Jesus your most important identification? Because if Jesus is your most important identification, if you are part of God's family and you're, you're identifying as one of his, then here's what that means. That means all of your other relationships are subordinate to your relationship with God. That means that if God tells you to do something, you're going to do it. And even if that compromises or puts a strain on your other relationships because God is most important. In fact, even if it costs you your very life, you're going to go with God. God is number one. And I want to ask you right now, is God preeminent in your life? Is he number one in your life? Do you identify with God more than you identify with anyone else? You know, um, Daniel did a great series with us on science and faith and so forth a few uh, months ago on our Wednesday night series. And he talked about how According to recent studies and surveys, people are more likely to change their religious convictions and their religious identification, so to speak, than they are to change their political views. Now, that should never be said of a Christian. And I'm going to tell you right now, if your political opinions are more important to you than, than having a biblical worldview, than identifying with Christ, then you got yourself a serious problem, okay? And that problem is in your heart, and you better change that. You better fix that, okay? The most important identity that you should have is your identity in Christ, okay? Identify yourself with the Lord, all right? The second thing that I want you to see in this passage, uh, so one is identity, number one, okay? The second thing I want you to see is we're supposed to humble ourselves. We're supposed to be humble. Now, this, I want to say that all of these things are not just kind of a one-time deal, you know, where it's like, well, on Sunday I identify with Christ, but the rest of the week I don't. God knows that, okay? Because God knows your past, your present, and your future. And the same thing is true with humility. This has got to be a state of mind, a habit, a discipline. This has got to be the main deal for you, okay? It can't just be a one-time thing. Well, I humble myself on Sunday, but Monday, you know, no, no, you got to be humble. You got to be humble. You know, God is telling you to adopt humility as your de facto, uh, you know, your, your, your default uh, uh, character and personality and who you are. You know, you've got to be humble. This is why Andrew Murray says humility, the place of entire dependence on God, is the first duty of the creature and the root of every good quality. He also writes, likewise, pride or the loss of this humility is the root of every sin and evil. I don't see a whole lot of humility in our society today. And quite frankly, and sadly, I don't see a lot of humility in the Christian community overall today. First of all, humility erases any bigotry or racism or any sense of superiority that one group may have over another group or that one individual may feel over another individual. If you have a sense of arrogance or elitism that you or the groups or groups that you identify with are somehow better uh, than someone else, and uh, and again, I see this I see this all over the place, you know, frankly, in all different kinds of groups and communities and political tribes and so forth. People genuinely feel that they're better than other people by virtue of either, you know, their skin color or by their uh, their culture that they live in or by their upbringing or by their viewpoints on different things or how woke they are or how much more educated they are or how much whatever. If you have a sense of superiority for any such factor or any such thing, you are not a very humble person. You know, humility means that you lower yourself. Humility means that you're not going to think of yourself more highly than you want to think. And let me just be clear here. We should be we should think of ourselves as it says in Psalm 139, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We are as it makes clear in the book of Genesis, made in the image of God. We are special to God, we're important to God. 
But that's because of God's grace. That's because of how awesome and wonderful God is. And yes, Jesus died for you and for me, but that's because of his grace and his love. We're nothing without God, nothing. And so when it comes to you know who I am and who you are, we have nothing inherent to ourselves by which we should feel superior to another person or another group or any of that nonsense. We should be humble. But in addition to that, people in an everyday practical sense can quite frankly not be very humble. Think about, uh, are, are you the kind of person where things have to be done your way? And if it's not done your way, well, then it's the wrong way. Well, you may not be very humble, okay? You know, are you the kind of person that's pretty stubborn that once you have made your mind up on something, your mind is closed to any new information or any new insights or any new way of looking at something? Well, you may not be very humble in that case. Are you the kind of person that, uh, that, uh, that feels like, you know, you've mastered the particular subject. You don't need to listen to anyone else. Well, you may not be very humble. Now, please don't get me wrong. Uh, the Bible talks about how we should seek wise counsel. Uh, and so, you know, it's important that when it, when it comes, like if I'm going to go out and try to learn how to, um, you know, uh, let's just, I'm going to make up an example here. If I'm going to go out and try to uh, be a better, let's say I'm a CEO of an of a insurance company and I want to learn how to be a better CEO of that insurance company. Well, I'm gonna, I'm going to study other insurance companies and other insurance CEOs, or, you know, if I'm looking for general business principles, other successful CEOs, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. That's not being arrogant or prideful. That's just being wise. Okay. So you, you know, you be careful what voices you listen to and make sure that you're getting the right input, of course. But I'm saying if you believe that you have all the answers and that there's nothing you can learn, then uh, then that, there's a problem. And quite frankly, even when it comes to someone who may not be as successful as you are, I have found that I can learn something from just about anyone that God puts in the path of my life. Uh, and so, so you must approach life and certainly approach God from a spirit of humility. You must be humble. Don't think that you've got all the answers. You know, the fact is we have a whole lot more things that we don't know than there are things that we do know. And we have a whole lot more questions than we have answers. And quite frankly, sometimes often we don't even know the right questions to ask. We don't even know about certain questions, you know. So I, I encourage you, approach life and certainly approach God with humility. Don't walk around with a chip on your shoulder. And let me add to that, be careful when it comes to what sense of entitlement you might have. Now, I believe that people should honor their agreements. And so if someone has entered into an agreement with you, whether that be you know, marriage vows, for example, you know, like so if, if your husband or wife cheats on you, you know, and, and you call them out on that and they say, well, uh, don't have a spirit of entitlement. Well, OK, you know, that you know, it's not a spirit of entitlement so much as you're holding them accountable to a commitment that they made to you. OK, so I certainly believe that people should honor their commitments and their agreements. OK, but with that important caveat and exception made clear. Be very careful about approaching life with a sense of entitlement. because and, and certainly be careful about approaching God with a sense of entitlement. You know, a lot of times we just feel that we are entitled to have a certain life and life is supposed to turn out a certain way. Uh, well, you know, quite frankly, we got to be very careful about that because our expectations need to be realistic. And another side note on this. Be very careful with the expectations that you have when it comes to other people. Yes, people should honor their agreements. Yes, they should honor their commitments. But frankly, remember the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you want people to cut you some slack when you mess up and fall short, then maybe you want to cut other people some slack too, okay? Because remember, you're not perfect, just like the people around you aren't perfect either, okay? But not only that, yes, people should honor their commitments and their agreements. But be very careful expecting other people to perform beyond their capacity. You know, we often base our expectations of others on our personal needs and wants. That's not the way to go, okay? All right, uh, because other people are not capable of meeting all of your needs and all of your wants. Just because you have a need in your life doesn't mean the people in your life have let you down. Okay, this doesn't necessarily mean that. Okay, so just be very careful. Set realistic expectations when it comes to others, and and certainly even set realistic expectations of God. And by that I mean, look at what God actually promises you. Don't don't expect something from God that God hasn't even promised you. This is one of the reasons why many people walk away from their faith. They have this this mindset, these expectations of God that are not grounded in Scripture. They're grounded in their own preferences and their own wants. 
in their own uh, way. This is how God should be. You know, I listened to an interview the other day. It was a very good interview. It was a very healthy, constructed dialogue between a Bible-believing Christian apologist. And again, when I say apologist, I'm not saying someone that apologizes for their faith. But uh, an apologist is someone that def- explains the faith, the Christian faith, and defends it, okay? And this particular apologist is uh, Sean McDowell. And uh, he's the son of Josh McDowell. Uh, and so uh, Sean McDowell was interviewing a quote-unquote progressive Christian pastor. Now, for those of you that don't know, progressive Christians are Christians who quite bluntly believe they've progressed beyond the Bible, okay? Now, if that's not progression, okay? If you move beyond the Bible, you're in bad territory, dangerous territory, okay? Uh, but so progressive Christians basically believe that, uh, you know, we can, we can kind of set the Bible aside. Uh, and so th- don't go down that road, okay? There's nothing progressive about setting the Bible aside, okay? I'll be clear on that. But anyway, and I'm and quite frankly, I have a hard time even sometimes calling them Christians, you know. Uh, but anyway, that's that's another message, okay? But in this in this discussion, uh, Sean McDowell was laying out what the Bible says about God, and the and this progressive pastor responded, "Well, that's not a God I want anything to do with." Now consider the premise of that. This progressive uh, pastor, and again, you know, I just, you know, there are some people that are pastors that shouldn't be pastors, okay? But anyway, uh, this progressive pastor was basically saying, I have a conception of God and what God should be and who God should be, and he needs to meet that that con- conception that I have, otherwise I don't want anything to do with him. That is the direct opposite of humility. Humility is approaching God on God's terms, not your terms and not my terms. Who are we? Who do you think you are to tell God who God needs to be? Who do you? Who do we think we are to tell God, God, you're doing it the wrong way? Excuse me? You know, do we define what's right and wrong, or does God define that? Do we define truth, or does God define truth? Remember, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. And so, you know, the first thing about humility is remember who you are, remember who God is, and that our proper posture before God is on our face before him in humility, on our knees in submission to him. That is the heart of humility. Humble yourself before God. And if you find yourself in disagreeing with God, it ain't God that needs to change. It's you, okay? Next, we see God say simply, and pray. Humble themselves and pray. So, what does that mean? Why does God say and pray? Isn't that kind of obvious? Solomon just prayed. Okay, here's the key. Get this, homie. A lot of Christians feel like after they say a prayer, they've prayed. That's it. Hey, I went to church on Sunday. We prayed on Sunday. I prayed over my meal. I prayed. They see prayer almost as a one-time event or as whatever. God is not encouraging the children of Israel here in this passage to see prayer as an event. Don't forget to have some events of prayer, some episodes of prayer in your life. No, God's not asking us to see prayer as an event or an episode. God's asking us to see prayer as a lifestyle. He's asking us to see prayer as our default setting before him. The Apostle Paul tells us, remember, to pray without ceasing. We should be in a state of prayer before God regularly, routinely. It should be part of our spiritual habit. We should be in prayer before God. Often our default setting isn't to pray, it's to it's to complain. Often our default setting isn't to pray, it's to talk to other people about what's going on in our life. Our default setting needs to be prayer. We need to pray. Uh, and so I want to ask you, is prayer a regular habit and routine of your life? You know, uh, this is one of the reasons I'm asking you all to consider getting a prayer journal, okay? Seriously and favorably <laughs> consider getting a prayer journal. It's not because a prayer journal is magic, but it helps get you in the habit of prayer. You know, if, if you if you actually have to have to go through the routine, so to speak, of getting out your prayer journal and actually writing out your prayer request to God and, and putting in writing some of your thoughts and some of your prayers to God, it helps It helps you focus, okay? And it helps you make that a disciplined part of your life. And so I encourage you to do this prayer journal, okay? And and, and you know what? When You'll then be able to look back on, on, your, on each day. Did I write in my prayer journal today? Well, maybe that means you just didn't really pray today. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that your prayer journal should be your only time of prayer. Absolutely not. I believe you should pray throughout the day. I believe you should pray while you're driving. Uh, eyes open, of course. I believe you should pray over your meals. I believe you should pray at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day. But I also believe that at some point in the day, either at the very beginning or the very end or during, whatever whatever it is works for you in your schedule, at some point in your day, you should set that aside and say, I am focusing 
on my relationship with God right now. This is God time, and it's a priority for me. And so make that time with God a priority. God wants to spend time with you. He wants to He wants to have a conversation with you, not just where you're on the rush and you're on the run and you're just asking things from him. Where you're, oh, give me this, give me that, do this, do that. You know, um, God wants to have a relationship with you and that means two-way communication and so you've got to make it a priority in your life to talk with God and listen to God okay make prayer a regular part of your life all right the next thing we see here is that God says and seek my face okay now this is these are all closely related okay so to seek the face of God means that you're gonna make it a priority to spend time with God but it's also interesting that uh, there's two things I want to emphasize on this. One is often when it comes to our prayers, we just want to get stuff from God, okay? So we seek God's blessings. We seek God's stuff. We seek God's direction. We seek something from God. But when was the last time we just wanted to dwell in the presence of God? We just want to be with God. We just want to be with Him. You know, we're not asking anything from Him other than we just want to be with you god we just want to spend time with you i just want to be in your presence i just want to be with you now this is awkward for a lot of us because a lot of us have a hard time uh not talking <laughs> you know you ever think about, a lot of us have a hard time with silence there's a reason why silence is a discipline that's so why the bible tells us be still and know that i am god how often do you just get still and quiet before God where you're not saying anything and you're just silent before him but you're intentionally seeking his face you're intentionally in his presence but you're just quiet you're just quiet and you're just there a lot of us have a hard time because life gets in the way and we're just like things come into our mind and you know and it's like it's hard well you know that's part of the discipline God understands that but you know this is why it's important sometimes when we when we sit down and we just want to commune with god and then and then life starts throwing those things in our mind you know what i'm talking about we start remembering oh, i gotta do this i gotta do this i gotta do this how about during that when that happens just give that to god just give it to god in your prayers okay lord you know my mind's racing a mile a minute here so i need you to take care of this i need guidance and wisdom on this now let me get back to just enjoying your presence, you know. And and you and you can. That's where the prayer journal comes in. You could be you could be sitting out uh, and have the prayer journal in front of you. And when things hit your mind, you know, stresses, worries, whatever, you can be writing those down as prayer requests to God. You know, you, you can kind of make this work however you want. But the bottom line is, be still before God. Make it a habit to spend time, quality time with God, and enjoy His presence. The next thing we see is turn from their wicked ways. Now this may seem self-explanatory, but basically it just means stop sinning, <laughs> repent. All right, this is repent. This is not asking for you to be perfect. This is not asking for you to be someone that you're not. We all fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is no one righteous, no, not one. So in fact, it says that twice in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we are, we are imperfect. And we're gonna mess up from time to time but you as well you and you would know as well as I do that there are times where we get into habitual patterns of sin and where sin be, begins to define our lifestyle and where we we just surrender to the temptations and surrender to the addictions and sin becomes a part of who we are and and the Bible says that we're to turn away from our wicked ways and that means that when we, as we, when we turn away from our lifestyle of sin, we turn away from our sins. When we do mess up, we're supposed to get right back and start pursuing righteousness again. So, in other words, let's say that you're that you're trying to give up a particular addiction, okay? And so you commit it to God and you repent and you give it up. And then let's say uh, several weeks or months later you fall again into that addiction. Well, that means you don't just give up and say, "Well, I guess it's I guess it's no use. I might as well just continue on." No, you you get up, you 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 shake yourself off, and you keep on going, keep on pursuing righteousness and godliness in your life, okay? Because you want to leave that junk behind, and you want to pursue a right relationship with God. Now, again, we are saved. 
by the grace of God, okay? And so we're not saved by our works. And so you don't need to worry about earning your salvation, nor do you need to worry about uh, if you mess up and sin, you're going to lose your salvation. But we are saved to do good works. Paul makes that clear in his letter to the church in Ephesus. We are saved to do good works. And so we should want to please God. And if you really love God, you're going to want to please him. If you really love him, it's not going to be about Oh well, if I if I mess up, God's gonna gonna wrap me on the knuckles or something. It's not. It, it, your your relationship with God should be about you love God, you love Him, and you want to be in His presence, and you want to experience His joy in your life, and you want to please Him, and you want to honor Him, and you want to serve Him. So it's all about what you want, okay? And so here, turn away from the sins. Turn away from doing all that stuff that pleases yourself and ultimately pleases uh, Satan, you know, uh, and instead trust God with your happiness. God will bless you and God will bring things into your life that will please you, you know, things that will make you joyful and happy, things that are going to be a blessing to you. So in other words, don't you pursue your own happiness. You pursue God and trust God with your happiness, okay? And so let's once again read our passage. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So here's what God wants. He wants us to identify with him and make him preeminent in our lives. He wants us to humble ourselves before him and in life in general. And he wants us to seek his face and pray regularly. And he wants us to turn from our wicked ways. When we do that, he promises that he will hear us, that he will forgive us, and that he will heal and bless us. And so if you want healing and victory and blessings in your life, if you want to experience a robust, victorious, and joyful prayer life with God, and you should, then I give you 2 Chronicles 7.14. And I hope that this week you will meditate on this passage. And here are your assignments. Number one, get that prayer journal and, uh, and, and start writing in that. And at the very beginning of this uh, series, I want you to write out a prayer to God. And I want you to do an inventory, a self-evaluation, if you will. I want you to be honest and write out before God the state of your current relationship with him. Do you feel close to him? Do you feel distant from him? Are you confused? Do you not know where you stand? Write that out. Be honest, okay? Uh, what are the biggest needs in your life right now? What are the pain points in your life? Write all that out right now. What do you? What, what are the biggest blessings in your life? Write that out. It may take you a little time to do this. Things that are worthwhile do take some time, okay? And so, so take some time and do that. Write down where you feel you stand with God right now. Write down your biggest blessings and biggest needs right now, your biggest pain points, and write down questions that you have. Make that your initial prayer to God, okay? And, uh, and then commit that to the Lord in prayer, all right? And then I'd ask you to also write out the Lord's Prayer in your prayer journal. Write that out because we're going to be referring to that throughout this entire series. And then finally, write out 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And then do an inventory, a self-evaluation. How are you doing in relationship to 2 Chronicles 7, 14, okay? So that's your assignment, all right, uh, for this week. So I hope you'll do that and hope you'll be reflecting on that throughout the week. Also, if you have any questions about anything we've talked about today, and maybe you don't know where you stand in your relationship with God, maybe uh, you haven't, uh, um, you're not sure if you're fully committed to God, reach out to me. Let's talk about that, okay? If you have given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, then you're part of the family of God. I would ask, have you been baptized? If you have questions about baptism and how you can follow the Lord and believer's baptism, reach out to me. That's the first step of obedience, you know, to publicly show that you're a part of God's family and to publicly show what God has done for you through his son, Jesus Christ. And then uh, if you have questions about church membership, I'll be happy to talk with you about that too. All right. And so at this time, I'm going to close this in prayer and then I'm going to ask you to jump on our Zoom call. And again, check your email for information on that. And we'll just have a time of fellowship informally together on Zoom right after uh, this broadcast concludes. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for everything you've done. I pray that you'll uh, give us a great rest of this Sunday. And we commit uh, the rest of this day. And we commit our prayer lives to you. May you put your hand on each of us and tell us exactly what you want us to do. And may we be obedient to that. And we ask this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Well, God bless you and take care.